Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to introduce today to Fuensanta Nieto as our James A.D. Cox Distinguished Lectureship in Architecture of this academic year. So Fuensanta, that is a very old friend, is the founding partner at Nieto Sobejano Arquitectos with Enrique Sobejano, and she is also professor at Universidad Europea de Madrid. Her practice, based in Madrid and Berlin, has been the recipient of numerous international awards, including the Aga Khan Award of Architecture, the Piranesi Prix of Rome, the Alvaralto Medal, and the Gold Medal of Merit in Fine Arts. Their extensive work ranges from houses, projects, or hotels, to markets, sports centers, auditoriums, and especially museums. They are experts working with existing structures and historical persistences, and the dialogue between the new architecture with the historical memory impregnated in the place. Their major works include the Medina Zahara Museum, the San Telmo Museum in San Sebastián, the Martín Chirino Foundation in Las Palmas, the Johannium Museum Extension in Graz, the Contemporary Art Center in Córdoba, and the Arbo Pret um, Center in Estonia. I don't think I pronounced any of them correct, but I try. So along with uh, being widely published in international magazines and books, the film's work has been widely exhibited in the Biennale di Venezia, the MoMA New York, the Kunsthaus in Graz, and the Mass Foundation in Bologna. So before starting, I would like to extend our gratitude to Professor James A.D. Cox's family, friends, and former students that establish and make possible this lecture every year and for giving us the opportunity to enjoy and learn from the work of these great international architects that promote a more diverse and international faculty and learning environment at the University of Virginia School of Architecture, as exemplified by Professor Emeritus James A. D. Cox. So with that, I will give the word to Juan Santa. Thank you very much, Maria. And thank you very much to, for inviting me here. Uh, really, for me, coming to, to this university is kind of mythical because I don't know why we have tried to come for a lot of times, not to the university, simply to visit. And always something has happened that I haven't been able to come. So I'm really happy of being here today with you and especially happy also of being received by somebody like Maria, which uh, I know for a long time ago. I'm not going to tell you how long, because I guess it's going to discover my age and her age. <laughs> and that's going to be a problem for me, not for her. So I don't know. So uh, and thank you uh, for Professor J James D. Cox to, for making this possible and for making it possible to bring me here. So I hope that we enjoy a nice time together. I was going to speak about something else, but uh, after being today with Maria, I decided to change. She told me that she was going uh, a lot into this uh, learning a lot about music. So I have a very nice project, which I love, about music, Maria Arbo Part. You did pronounce it correctly. And, uh, well, I changed the lecture just for you in order to be able to, <laughs> to hear some music of a wonderful composer. Let me start... Um, I can. Okay, so um, as Maria said, uh, we have uh, made a lot, of, a lot of museums because our practice, our practice basically what we are working of, uh, through competitions. So today I decided to speak about some of the museums that we have done, though some of the last projects, though I'm calling them museums, maybe are not such a museum, but a foundation. Um, and I want to do so by speaking about them through the idea that generated them. Because all of this, uh, for us, it's important to link a, a, a project to a concept. And, and uh, so I'm going to speak about concepts like uh, the idea that generated a museum through landscape or through the art that is already in the museum or even to, through art in general or talking about metaphors like working as archaeologists instead of architects in a museum for archaeology. Uh, in that sense, uh, we always start working with a concept and for us it's important to understand if we are running correctly and uh, um, keeping the concept through all the 
um, time of design and construction. For us, it's important sometimes to stop, to look backwards and to see if it's really possible and if we have really done what we have been doing and if we are following the concept that originated, uh, that originated the project. So let me start with the project of Madinat al Sara, a museum of archaeology. For me, uh, this was one of the, our first important projects. And this, uh, for me, it's like very difficult to start speaking about our work without speaking and explaining a little bit this project, because uh, a lot of the ideas that we have, with which we have kept afterwards, are um, started with this project of Madinat al Sara. This is a beautiful city, uh, a city that's, that was built by the first caliph of the caliphate of Cordoba, Abderrahman III, in the year 940. And uh, it had a, a very short life. It was completely destroyed in the year one, uh, 10, 1010. And that made it a very important archaeological site for archaeologists because it stood in a very short period of time so that they could study that period of time very uh, especially. So um, the government of Andalusia decided to launch a competition for the archaeo uh, archaeological uh, museum of site of Madinat al Zahra. The city was so completely destroyed that um, even when they found it in the year nine, uh, in, in the beginning of the 20th century, they did not know that it was Medina Zara. Uh, the people that found it, these people here, they thought that it was another place. So the city is kind, uh, started to be kind of legendary. It was built in a mountain and uh, with a very uh, geometrical proportions. It's a double, nearly a double square of uh, 750 by 1,500 meters, and it only breaks the square in the point where it joins the mountain. Uh, these images are these images are here the in in uh, 1010 when the when it was built and you see the beautiful carvings and especially the color it was built of stone and red painting and then in 1911 when it was discovered and in 2010 when we built the museum in order to be able to make more research also about this city for us uh, when we started this project uh, and whenever we work with an existing or with a pre-existence, for us it's important to try to understand the origin of the project and to start or uh, to establish a kind of dialogue, relations to the project with which we are working. So we remember when we started the project about this other site that we had visited, an archaeological site in which the archaeologists were working by boxes and were referring what they were discovering to a grid. So what we decided to do in this project is to work as archaeologists instead of architects, by meaning that we are making a, a building underground. We traced the grid, and the grid was going to organize the inside of the building as well as the outsides of the gardens that were around it, and especially the roof, because in a building that is buried, it's only the roof, the one that it's the unique facade, because the roof was very important in this site because, as if you remember, I said that uh, the archaeological site was built in a mountain. So it's the only place that can be seen from above. So we wanted to link the roof both to the site and also to the landscape. And that is why we chose those materials, red corten steel and white concrete, the colors of Medina Zara and also of the landscape surrounding it. Of course, uh, a buried building, we are working with light coming from patios. In this case, six different patios. This one the, uh, that gives light to the vestibule and to the public areas, the one of the cafeteria, the one of the museum, the one for the offices, and the one for the entrances. All of this uh, uh, work uh, around, the, they introduce the light in different ways in the different spaces of the museum that is also built as a double square. And that is another one of the relations that we establish with the original city uh, of the archaeological site. Like in this way, like uh, the archaeologists bring out the city of Madinat al Zahra, and whenever they take the ground out, the, the buildings appeared as finished in the same way. And because of the decision of the materials, our building would appear as finished when the structure and the concrete were finished, uh, were finished building. 
And for us, it was important. This project for us was a project about relation, about establish a dialogue between the two places, uh, sometimes uh, quite personal, like, for example, these different views, open spaces that give light to the spaces that are behind, or these long distances, long views that you can see from open doors and you can see the long distances in the back, or the shared rhythm of columns and beams, or these uh, walls standing freely that speak about the spaces that you are, don't see anymore now, but you can imagine them, or these long and linear um, patios that protect from the strong light of Andalusia, or these long entrances that share the same proportions, and especially, of course, the roofs, the roofs of the city that in a different scale, in a way, we try to establish that kind of dialogue by opening um, lines of light and also patios. The roof that, as I said before, is one of the elements or the only element that you can see from the mountain. And we hope that when you look at it, uh, you uh, understand it as belonging to the landscape. So for us, this project, it was important because for us, it started the way that, from, that we were going to, to, um, to build in the, in the next years when we built in relation to existing buildings. A dialogue that we establish between the two different elements. A dialogue that, as I say, sometimes is personal because it also depends a lot on the uh, previous ideas and previous uh, knowledge that do, you have of the place. And for us, it's also that is very important to understand and to know the place in which we are going to work. And from this place in Cordoba, that we are talking about Islamic architecture with these long walls, we are going to go to another very um, Islamic place, like the city of Marrakesh, in which we also have these long and beautiful walls. In this case, it's the wall of the city, the pink city. And if I uh, said before that all of our projects, or nearly all, especially uh, as museums, come from competitions, I think this is one of the only ones of the projects, this museum in Marrakesh, that did not come from, from a competition. It was somebody that came to our door, knocked in the door, and said, do you want to build a museum? Which is something that I never dreamt that was going to happen to us. It did happen, but it's the only museum that we haven't built. We did design it, though. <laughs> and uh, so this is a museum in the city of Marrakesh uh, for a, co a special collector and builder of the city of Marrakesh of, uh, of uh, African art. So for us, again, it was important to understand the place in which we are going to work. This is an image of the Medina of Marrakesh. Uh, Medina means the central area of the city. For us, it was this very special area uh, in which you see that all the city is built by the addition of different houses. And if you look at the grids of the city, this is the Medina. At another scale, this is a place that is planted of um, trees, and they also follow this grid. Or even if you go to the floorings, you always see this uh, this geometrical feeling and this, ge uh, this geometrical situation in which you see that every of one of these photographs is formed by addition of elements. For us also it was important to try to understand the light of Marrakesh. The same light as Cordoba. It's a very strong sun, so they have these walls that uh, bring the light, uh, protect from the light, but at the same time bring it in through a small and uh, a small holes that has this very powerful light in one point and then that it disappears in the spaces. And uh, also these other elements of Islamic architecture that were very intriguing for us in the beginning, these elements that are built, that are built alone, and that they form a space by the addition of one to another. So we tried, uh, for us it was important to understand this, and we tried to make a project with all these uh, elements in our head. So what we decided to do in the beginning was to decide uh, the museum by elements. In this case, we uh, tried to build it with the addition of different skylights. We did try a lot of different grids. We did try a lot of different possibilities, and we built a lot of models. 
because uh, for us is is um, building um, with the skylights in a museum is important and at the same time is complicated because the light that goes in the inside has to be a very homogeneous light. So we had to be careful in that sense and it was not only about the concept of how to build uh, but it was also about how the light was going to get to the different places of the museum. So we, uh, we built all these models and we compare them, and, but as you see, all of the models follow the same concept, which is the concept, that concept of taking the skylight and building by addition, which is the same thing that we did and try to put it together in the, uh, in, in the whole building of the museum. And this is all the different boxes that together form the space of the museum. Because uh, in this case, the project that we are dealing with as you see here in the, with the models, we are studying how the light, uh, the, the, the building is of two floors. And here what we are doing is we are studying how the light comes in not only to the first floor, but how the light also goes down to the second floor. The project was not only a museum, but was more ambitious, a bigger one. And we had to build um, also uh, an auction house, a place where the art dealers could, uh, could have the um, art until they came out to an auction. And also also, the, the developer of this uh, museum, he wanted a very important restaurant. Uh, when we had to, uh, to deal with all of these elements, again, we uh, tried to do it in the same way, trying to do it by addition. And in that sense, uh, we looked also, we had a triangular space, and we had to fit the, in that triangular space all the different spaces. We decided to create an empty space in the center, which was going to be the vestibule, and around it, all the buildings were going to work. In the same way as we had seen in another places, like in Alhambra de Granada, or the Fatipur Sikri, or even the Palace of Bahia, which was nearby. So we tried to understand the way that all these places were working with the in interior courtyards, patios, and we tried to work in the same way. So here we had the long building, which is going to be the auction building and the restaurant. The museum is the big one in the back part, and the a place to keep the artists here, and here was the VIP area and the restaurant for the people that came to the auction to buy the art. In the inside, as you see uh, now with the, the uh, um, skylights bringing in the light in a very homogeneous way, and also that other big skylight we, which we were working with in the model, trying to take the light to the lower part. About the material, which was also very important to us, we also looked to the places that were built around us, and they were built with that beautiful adobe. Uh, and all, all these uh, Marrakesh uh, places that are built with this material, so we decided to work with that same material. And it's amazing because it was a coincidence, because the person that uh, knows more about working with adobe is precisely a German. And he had his office very near our office in Germany, which we couldn't believe. So we said, this is really good luck. We are going to be able to build this. So we are working with them. And because uh, not in all places you can build with adobe, but here we could. So we decided and we uh, did these drawings in order to build the exterior walls with adobe. This is the central space, the uh, open space from which you can enter all the different spaces and all the different buildings. And in the inside, the material was a white um, stucco. Of when, so all the entrances, the buildings were built in adobe. When we cut a, 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 to build in an entrance, we cut it with the white stucco so that you could recognize the way to go in. Well, we did manage to develop all the project, but it never happened uh, because the developer, uh, well, he had money problems. And at the end, he decided not to do this one. From Marrakesh, we are going to another project, another museum, in the, quite nearby, in Las Palmas. Well, quite near, I mean, it's in the very, very south of Spain, in Las Palmas, where uh, we built uh, and restored the Castillo de la Luz. Uh, the Castillo de la Luz was the very, it's uh, situated here, and I want you to keep in mind this, this aerial photograph, because as you see the dot, 
there is a small castle there, the one that you have seen in the, in the image in the beginning, and you see that it's completely surrounded by an area of the city. Even I've been there and you cannot see the sea from there. And this is impressive for me because it shows us how much the city has grown around it because originally this castle was standing at the sea. This is an original drawing which we have the floor plan and the castle was really there on the border of the sea because it was built in the 15th century as the first defense castle of the Canary Islands. This is an image that, that we found in a museum, and you see the castle is there in the border of the sea, so when the water of the sea went up, two of the walls of the castle were inside the water. This is the way we, uh, this is the way we found it on the uh, drawing to the right, because there was a restoration in the year uh, 1976, and this is the way the castle was before the restoration. For us, again, it's important, important to try to understand it because there was, uh, when we entered this competition, the brief of the competition said that it was going to be a museum for uh, the sea. When we uh, won the competition, then they said that no, it was not going to be a museum of the sea, it's going to be the museum of the city. And after the museum of the city, it was going to be the museum of a painter called Millares and at the end, for us, it was not important because for us, we decided that it was going to be the museum of its own history. So for us, it was important to understand it. Here you see the origin of the castle was this little square that you're seeing there, which was a small tower that was the first one to be built. After that tower, some years later, the walls around it were built and in between the tower and the walls, it was filled of sand because it was not a place to live, it was a, a place of defense. In order to understand what, uh, how it was, we did several models as the way you, uh, you see here. And also in the model, you, are going to, you start to see what was our proposal. Because what we decided to propose was, well, let's take away that sand between the original tower and the walls. Let's build there a big space uh, of three um, stories high for the museum. And at the same time, we are going to be able to see the tower that originated the castle. What really happened was that when we took off the sand in between, we found this wall that maybe you can see better in section here. It was a wall that nobody knew about it because it had been covered by sand for the 500 years. And it was a discovery and really it was the place got full of archeologists trying to understand what was the meaning of this wall there. So, for us, really, what happened is was that we really uh, were exhibiting the history of the castle. But at the end, it did find the use, and a very good one, because this is the outside of the castle, and this here is a piece done by the sculptor Martin Chirino, and now it's the foundation of that same sculpture. And really, I have to say that the collection and the castle, they work very well, one to each, for each other. Uh, our intention with the walls of the castle was of restoration. We restored the stone and the new elements that we had to include, we did in court and steel and trying to always leave a distance between the stone and the new elements. New element that is necessary because this was an elevator to go to the roof in order for um, people with less mobility. In the inside, uh, this is the space in which we cleaned, that we took off, off the sand. This is the, the tower that is now seen after 500 years, and this is the new wall that appeared. Our decision about the material was that whenever we had to build something structural, we built it in white concrete, but trying to always leave spaces not touching the walls. And whenever we had to build something that was not structural, we used cordon steel. Here you see uh, the sculptures are of uh, Martin Chirino, and now this is its foundation. In this photograph, really, uh, you can see a lot of the history of the castle. Even this is the old, the new wall, that, I mean the old wall that we found under the sand. And here this is something that for me was interesting because the archaeologists explained us that it could be um, the, a, the, a cannonball that was uh, destroyed part of the... Of, of the, of, I mean, of the wall, and then that it was filled also with volcanic stone. 
we used, uh, we cleaned the stone in the places that the stone was supposed to be seen, and we used white stucco in the places that there was, the stone was not supposed to be seen. This is the space in between the two walls that now you can walk through. And uh, again, the relation between the original wall in built in stone, because it was supposed to be seen for that, and all the other spaces built in stucco in order to be able uh, to put the exhibition. Especially, and again, the same criteria here using uh, the um, slab on the top of concrete, but letting the light come through in order to give light to the castle. Because at the end, if I tell you the name of the castle, Castillo de la Luz, literally the translation is Castle of the Light. So for us, it was important to recover this idea of light going away of that dark interior and bringing the light into the castle that can be seen in its own history after 500 years. And from this Castle of Las Palmas, we are going to another city of Spain, Valladolid, in the center of the city, where we had the chance, and this is, was very special for us, to work in this facade and in this um, amazing cloister. Uh, this was a building built in the late, uh, fort, in, in the late uh, 15th century, and it was a late Gothic, very late Gothic um, college of um, a, a students um, that were studying physics and metaphysics. It's one of the best, best examples of Spain, and for us it was very important because we understood that the uh, building was we very well kept in its central area, so there we uh, really worked through restoration. As you see, we kept, uh, we recovered the stone, and the only thing we changed because there was not, they were not existent was the doors. In the cloister, we also recovered the stone, we recovered the doors, and we worked in the stone, cleaning it with, by means of laser cleaning. Uh, also very important was the different collections of uh, wooden roofs that you see there. This is one of the uh, part of the museum, as also these two other ones that you see here. And uh, especially important, the restoration of the stair and the restoration of the wooden element above that was completely um, um, uh, covered. In other places, like here, where this was supposed, this, this was the area where the monks were supposed to sleep, we did cut some open areas because, of course, this is also a museum and it had to work as a museum. A museum in which we also did the museography, and we uh, worked with the director of the museum in putting special pieces in the in the beginning at, at the end of these long new corridors that were open. These other elements of the roofs were not of the of the building, but they were part of the collection. So we worked with them in order to put them in uh, and exhibit them in some of the different areas of the building. Also, uh, we had the opportunity of work in an area that was completely destroyed and the museum really needed a, a bigger space in order to be able to exhibit the bigger pieces. So we recovered the volume that was built there before and we recovered it in white concrete, a space in which after the big pieces of the museum that belonged to the museum were exhibited. Another uh, different element was a small building that we added uh, that was going to be the reception building, the reception area where you could buy the tickets, leave your coats, and after start the visit to the museum. Uh, that, was, uh, that is the entrance door, and to, to uh, the entrance door it is, is designed looking to the art that was exhibited in the museum. These uh, beautiful pieces of art that you, I don't know the name in English, but that you can find in the churches and that tell you the story in different pieces and different pieces in the same way that we designed the entrance to the museum. And from Valladolid, we are going out of Spain to the city of Halle in East Germany. And it is here where we uh, uh, won also the competition for the Morrisburg Museum that was uh, built as an expressionist museum in the Morrisburg Castle, which is the place that you are seeing there. The castle was built also in the 15th century, and I don't know, I'm telling you a lot of these buildings have been built in the 15th century, and it had a little bit the same story as Medina Zara. It was a sad story because uh, it was destroyed um, in the War of the Thirty Years, 
not very long, not very long after it was built. The important thing is that it was destroyed and it was uh, kept like that for a very long time, really until very late the 20th century, where two of its wings were restored for the Expressionist Museum. After that, a competition was launched to restore the other two wings. So we ent when we entered this competition, we found the castle in this situation. Uh, and at the same time, the other two wings also in this situation, which for us was important because we saw these um, very special roofs. And for us, uh, we were impressed with the steepness of those roofs that uh, were also distributed uh, along the whole city and were painted by one of the painters what, that was going to be exhibited uh, in the collection, in the Expressionist collection, Feininger, that painted the, all the city of Halle with this beautiful geometry. So for us, what we did was to propose a new, uh, a new roof, a new, uh, a new landscape in the roof that through its geometry and its skylights was going to establish a dialogue both to the uh, um, roofs of the city and at the same time to the geometry of the art that was going to be exhibited in the museum. We conceived the roof as a, as a structural roof and uh, it was only going to be lying on top of the walls, of the brick walls of the castle. In that sense, in that way, what we um, organized and we managed is that the extension that was needed for the, for the new exhibition area was hanging from the roof. And like that, we avoided, you are going to see in section, we avoided to have any new structure in the very impressive uh, wing that we are going to restore. And we managed to things, avoid the structure and keep the walls as we found them. Because we understood that the idea of the ruin was very linked uh, uh, in the minds of the people of Halle to the Morrisburg Museum. So we tried to uh, restore it, leaving it as it was. So uh, the contemporary architect, the new architecture and the old architecture, always in dialogue, but with this distance of respect, generating these uh, interstitial spaces and the new spaces uh, the new exhibition areas with the light that was coming from above from the skylights. Skylights that when we go out and because of the selection of material, really sometimes they disappear in the white skies of the city of Halle. The, um, for us, it was important the choice of material, not only uh, because, um, because we had to build it and uh, we had to build these very steep um, roofs, I don't know how you call it in English, sorry, sometimes my English gets bad. And we selected this um, uh, material um, aluminum panels because it was, uh, and we really, with the aluminum panels and with the excellent German construction, we really managed to have these lines that you are seeing there. This is our people inspecting the roof and also the roof in connection, the skylights in connection with the rest of the roofs of the city and and uh, with the geometry of the exhibit inside. Something that we uh, used in all the places that were not existent and we had to rebuild, like for example, that tower that was used for in introducing the works of art in the castle. So looking from the outside, the new roof, the restored uh, uh, wall outside the castle and the roof in connection to the rest of the city of Halle. And from Halle, we are going to go to San Sebastian in the north, where instead, uh, where we also proposed working with aluminium, in this case, recycled aluminium, in the new facade of the extension of the museum. In San Sebastian, we entered the competition for the extension of the Museum of San Telmo. This is uh, San Sebastian in the north of Spain, a really beautiful city. Um, and in this place there, just in, in, in the place where the, uh, land, the natural landscape and the city landscape get together, there is a convent of the 16th century that is now the Museum of San Telmo. It's, uh, um, for us also, it was important to understand this situation because it's, uh, this is an old uh, 
drawing, an old plan, in which is the old part of the city, the old city of San Sebastian, in which you also see that the natural landscape, the Monturgul, was free. And it's kept like that until our days, which is this photograph down there. Something really strange, because normally the cities go and cover everything uh, and don't respect the natural areas, which here has happened, and it has uh, only by uh, keeping these two elements that you also see there and there. So for us, it was interesting to understand the importance of the mountain here. And it is precisely here, in between the mountain and the convent, where we decided to put the extension. Because we tried to work in the convent by restoration and having all these uh, square meters that were a lot that we had to extend in this interstitial space between the mountain and the museum. In a way, we were also expressing this dialogue with the same geometry that uh, we, this is the new building, so we uh, organized a new patio in relation to the uh, cloister here, and this long space in relation to the same scale and proportion of the areas that we had on the other side. But of course, especially important was the facade of the new building, a facade that was the one that, going, that was going to relate uh, to the existing building and at the same time uh, establish a new, a new way of looking access and, and to access the mountain through these stairs here that belong to the building. To work in that facade, we uh, work with uh, two artists of San Sebastian, Leopoldo Ferran and Agustina Otero, and with them we walked through the mountain looking uh, to the way that these small green um, elements were coming out of the rock. And that is something that we tried to do uh, the same in our facade. We uh, decided to build a facade of aluminum panels with perforations, and through these perforations, the greenery is going to come out. The facade, look into it uh, in the distance. Now, this was right after finishing. If you look at it in the distance, it seemed to have a unique pattern. But if we go near, we understand that they are, it's a facade formed by the variation of five different panels. A panel that goes to a from a blank panel to a panel with more than 200 perforations. And they are grouped by a three by three and they are also they also extend to even to the doors of the building. The facade goes inside, conforming the patio, and it's through these two facades, two opaque facades, that we establish the relation of the two buildings. A facade that during the night, uh, not all of it is for the green, and during the night it can allow the light to come in, and it also gives light to the open spaces around it. The interstitial space in which we are building, as you see, in a very difficult conditions, uh, because they are long and thin spaces, are, uh, translate, are um, taken to the interior. And the new exhibition areas relate in scale and proportion to the elements, uh, to the bands of the cloister, also to the principal nave of the church that also belongs to the museum. The extension of the stair that we needed to do to go up to the roof, which is also exhibition space, contemporary architecture, always in relation to the existing architecture, but with a distance of respect. And in that sense, we can always return to the original situation in the same way that the two walls speak to each other, but they never touch. They are always have this distance between them. When the wall comes outside, it conforms the new plaza, a plaza that during the night gets light from the facade of the museum that transforms itself in a light installation in the city of San Sebastian. A museum that changes with the different stage, uh, stations of the year, uh, a, a, a facade that establishes the variations uh, through the different elements, uh, greens elements and flowers that are coming through it. And from San Sebastian, another museum in the city of Graz. Uh, Graz is a very special city because it's a, um, it's a protected city. It's a protected city by UNESCO. 
all the center of the city is protected because of its beautiful roofs. I think that that is something that maybe you can appreciate and you can see in this, in this photograph. So it's really very difficult to work in a city like this because you have to have the permission of UNESCO for any project in which you are uh, engaged. So here we entered a, a competition for the extension of three buildings, three buildings belonging to the Joanneum, uh, the um, building uh, a Museum of History, the Museum of Art, and the Library. There are these white buildings that you, are, that you are seeing here in the photograph, and they are in the situation that you see them, and we needed to make an extension for the uh, ent new entrances for the three buildings and also to uh, give some um, public spaces that they could use together. So what we decided to do is to create a new plaza, a new plaza that was going to be public space for the city and through a series of perforations were going, was going to be able to introduce light in a, a um, buried building light that was a building that was going to be organized around these, uh, sc uh, not skylights, these patios that are conical patios in the way that you see here in the section. And as you see, they connect the two buildings. In the upper part are the new public areas with entrances and with a small auditorium. And the lower part is for the collection of more than one million books of the library. Uh, in uh, the building was uh, built with these uh, conical uh, elements uh, through which you enter to the new space. And again, this dialogue that we want to establish between all the new here, we do it by the reflection of the buildings in the glass of the cones. So in a way, uh, any time that you are in the spaces below, the, the buildings outside are always present. In the buildings outside, we worked by restoration And really, the plaza, and it's, they use it for everything. And they use it in many different ways, like this artist uh, that is um, organizing in the skylight that brings light uh, to the a collection of books down. So from Graz, we are going to go to another museum back in Spain in the city of Lugo. Lugo is a small city in the north of Spain and has a very small center, but what it has is a really very, very impressive Roman walls. So here we won a competition uh, for a museum uh, in order to um, explain the story of the city. Uh, the museum was going to be situated in the outskirts of the city in an old industrial area, uh, and the idea of the uh, mayor of the city was the people came to the museum, they understood the history of, of Lugo, they left the car there, and then they were walking to the center. I'm going to try to... This should be a small video. For us, this project was about relating also to the volumes of uh, the wall of Lugo. So it's uh, a project that is done by the repetition of variation of one element, a cylinder. A cylinder that can be void or full. Through the void cylinders, we enter the museum and at the same time, we also, of course, give light to it. We try to use uh, uh, the topographical conditions of the place, so that's why we decided to put the building underground in order to continue with uh, the landscape that was in the outside of the city and create a new garden. The materials that we used was Corten steel in different ways uh, because we also wanted to link the museum and its material to the industrial area that was there before. The inside of the museum was white stucco, and as you see, the natural light came in to all the areas of the museum. Also here, for us, was very important the artificial light. Uh, the way that we were working with the Corten steel was working in different qualities of the steel. So uh, with the artificial light, 
the exterior skin nearly disappeared in order to be able to see uh, the internal structure, a structure that was going to link to the old industrial area. Also the natural light, introducing the light through skylights that you can see there that are white cylinders of light that are coming down or simply by open patios. As you see here, the inside structure that was specially built that way in order to link the building to the place. The industrial area that's still there behind the trees. In a building that we hoped that could relate both to the walls of the city that was going to be seen after and also to the area in which, in which it was built. And from Lugo, we are going to go to Cordoba, uh, which is a building that is also built from the addition and variation of the same element, in this case, an hexagon. Cordoba is a wonderful city in the south of Spain, and uh, we uh, had the opportunity of build here in that place here, which is uh, for us was very special because we are building very near this other place, which is the mosque of Cordoba. For, for me, one of the most impressive buildings of the world. Uh, I guess that that's a very strong uh, assumption, but it's true. I recommend you to go to see it. It's an amazing building. So in a way, building uh, another anything in front of that building was important for us. I mean, it's important and scary at the same time. So we did what we always do. We tried to understand uh, where we were building. And for us, it was important to understand that the Mosque of Cordoba uh, is that amazing space that is uh, organized all through uh, the variation and repetition of the same element, a double arch. There are other elements that also interested us, like this very, uh, the trellises of the mosque that seem to be a very, very difficult geometry, but in reality, if you study it, is uh, the, the mix of uh, different geometries that can work together. And also these roofs uh, in a very small scale, but that had the same geometry. So we, when we were thinking of the new building, we think if we could try to make a building working with these same elements. So we started working with an hexagon, an hexagon that we divided into three other different hexagons that uh, referred to the different dimensions of the uh, uh, exhibition spaces that we were looking for. One of 90 square meters, one of 60, one of 30. With that, what we did was different symmetries and rotations and we link them together. We uh, put them together in a completely fluid space that can work together in very different ways. And in the different ways that you link one hexagon with the other, you can have either one exhibition area up to nine exhibition areas. The last hexagon is a scaled hexagon in order to house uh, the um, a black area of the building. So the floor plan is the central space, which is going to be the exhibition area, the uh, vestibule that is a long vestibule and through which you can communicate to one by one of these other elements. And here, because this is not a museum, this is a place for the creation of art. So the artists are going to stay there. They are going to produce the art and then they are going to use the exhibition areas directly in contact with the place in which they are producing. Again, in section, all of these uh, hexagons also have a skylight, a skylight that, that is always uh, with the same concept but always different and that creates different spaces of more expansion of compression. Some, when you look from the, down, the skylights up and uh, you see the way that the light is coming in and the relation to the original roofs of the um, uh, Arab cities, we built different models because also the roof of the um, 
uh, the roof of the building was also solved with the same geometry. Not only the roof, but we took the same geometry also uh, uh, to the facade, a facade that I'm going to speak uh, later about it because through this geometry, it was also a media facade. So here we have the facade, which is an opaque facade that is filled by concrete panels. The building, which has two long facades, one to the river, one to the city, and that the entrances are produced on both sides of the short facade. The facade to the river, which is an opaque facade, but following the same geometry. And the facade to the city with the same geometry, but in this case with perforation. So the light can go in because in that upper part is where the uh, offices of the building are going to be. The inside, a completely different inside, more rough. In uh, What we were trying to do is that the artist reactioned to the building in any way, positive or negative, but we are trying to produce a reaction. This is the space in the center, the different hexagons, and this line here is the doors that are included in between the walls, which really is a structural beam that can go down and separate the different areas, as I said before, which can be nine different exhibitions area or simply one. Com more compressed spaces and more uh, expanded spaces with the skylights, which organize the entrance uh, to, the uh, to the auditorium and also to the upper part where the offices uh, um, of the building are. Offices that are built more in glass and that also let the transparency of the facade come in that at certain moments of the day brings the light in also reflecting the hexagons on the floor. Something that is also done through the opaque facade in a special elements and, and that are perforated, so at special moments of the day, the light can come in through those perforations. The building is already in use, and it's in use as it was thought of with more experimental art, artists in residence, and or for example here with this more experimental dancing. And uh, two days ago, not this, uh, an, another exhibition was installed, the exhibition of Francesca Thyssen, which is a fantastic, a fantastic exhibition of uh, video art. The building, uh, uh, the roof solved also through this same geometry. And again, our people inspecting the roof of the building, uh, a roof that is solved through these patios or skylights that uh, introduce the light to the, uh, to the inside same geometry that we take to the facade. In this case, a facade that is solved also by prefabricated panels. Panels that have a, 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 a light inside all of them, and this light reflects in the different faces of the hexagon, and they, um, um, they create like a media facade of 500 pixels. We work with three different scales. I don't know if you can see them there same geometry but different scales, so that from the outside you can really see what the artists are working in the inside. And from Córdoba, uh, we are going to Dresden, in which I'm not going to speak about the museum, but I'm going to speak of an archive. And uh, this is a, an archive that is on one bridge, I mean on one building on the other side of the river. And I want to start with this, uh, with this uh, painting, a painting of Canaletto. Canaletto was the painter uh, that painted the beautiful views of Venezia. And this is his cousin that painted beautiful views of the city, of, of different cities of Europe. So this is a painting of the 18th century. And this is, and we try to take a photograph with the same perspective, of course. It's a lot of years have gone by, and it's a very different uh, uh, city, the one that you are seeing there. But if you get near and you look to these two spots, and we get near, we see in this, this is the painting, and we see that building here, a building under construction in this situation like that. And here, the same building in the year 2021, and, and this is the building that the city of Dresden gave for the archive of, uh, for the new archive. And for me, it's important to see these two photographs together because it, they speak really about this process of uh, construction, deconstruction, reconstruction of the buildings and of the life of the buildings, a continuous life 
uh, that is very well explained in these two photographs. This is uh, um, the collector, uh, Emilio Marsona, an uh, Italian German collector that has an amazing collection of the avant garde, a collection of more than one million objects, and it has everything paintings, drawings, um, uh, objects, books, everything. They are distributed all around the city of Berlin. And the city of Dresden, recognizes the importance of, recognizing the importance of this collection, offered this building in order to keep the collection and being able to exhibit it in this, in this city. The building really was two, because it was the doors of the city. It was where the guards were in the city. The two buildings never got built, but it got built one of them in a little bit bigger scale. This is an image of the building. Uh, this is the building before the war. And this is a very sad image uh, of after the war and uh, how the building was nearly completely destroyed. The building got rebuilt uh, and with an insight uh, that with a very, uh, the, uh, very good rebuilt in the outside and in the east end it was just office space because it was the space that it was needed at that time. So when we got to the building, we found it empty in the inside and we had a cube, a new cube cube, empty cube, in which we are going to work. Of course, we kept the outside, and in the inside, we decided to use a new structure. We built a new slab that was going to be held by the um, stairs, the vertical elements, uh, and in the center, a void in which we are going to hang a cube that was going to house the archive collection. A cube, maybe that you see it better in this situation, that was going uh, hung by uh, uh, those elements of the structure of the roof. In that sense, we are going to be able to completely keep free the lower area, the uh, uh, entrance area, in order to use it for different exhibitions, like this one that is already projected of the jet set, or this another one of uh, the landscape uh, artist Burlemax, or this other one in which uh, it's of art and dancing, in which we were tracing the way of exhibiting through the movements of the dancers. The important thing is that the archive is on top. It's an archive of three different floors that can be accessed because it's a visitable archive. So in this uh, new slab, you can uh, uh, read and uh, uh, learn about the different elements that the archive has. And also important, and we can see it in this, in this section and in, in this model, that we are building very near a river. So we needed to put the archive a little bit up because in order to protect it from any possible flood of the river. This is the image that we presented to the competition, the hanging cube, the, the uh, structural elements of the stair, and the uh, uh, space for uh, and, uh, different uses on the ground. And this is the built, uh, I mean, the way that we had it a couple of months ago when we went to the site supervision. As you see the hanging cube, you see the elements the vertical elements, the stair, which uh, was very difficult to build uh, this stair because it's also structural, and of course, uh, this stair that is related uh, to um, the collection and uh, the elements of construction. And I don't want to finish this presentation without looking again to these two photographs because it's important again this way of thinking of the life of a building that goes from, the, from uh, construction, deconstruction, reconstruction. And from Dresden, we are going to go to Hamburg, in which we worked in this competition for the Mont Blanc house. Uh, the, this house that has these beautiful pens that you have seen in the image before. I always thought that Mont Blanc was Swiss, but no, Mont Blanc is German. Uh, these beautiful pens that, uh, and this uh, Mont Blanc, they wanted us to build a new um, building for art. And it had, they wanted it to be related to the logo, the Mont Blanc. And the building was going to be in the industrial area where they 
built their pens in those buildings that you have there. So what we decided to do was to give uh, that this industrial building a new facade. So we are going to use all the length of the building, a long building that was going to be a new, uh, a, a new facade and at the same time a new entrance to the industrial buildings behind. So what we did was uh, to build this building that was going to occupy all the space, that was going to give a new facade and a new entrance. And we did it by looking to the beautiful boxes in which they present their uh, pens. And at the same time, the box inside has a pen, and inside the pen has these very complex elements in order to produce the beautiful letters. And it's the same thing that we did with our building a direct facade that in the inside had the complexity necessary to solve the building that we were asked for. A building for art, for the exhibition of the uh, very important collection of pens, and at, in the upper part for different seminars in order to present the pens to different clients. The section was built around the central space, uh, central uh, communication space that also went to the other building and uh, with this dome that uh, also was the first um, art presentation. The facade in the exterior, it's done of black concrete and it's a facade with different layers, with different, um, how do you say, uh, different um, movements in the concrete, and it follows this idea of the hand using the pen, and at the same time, it also relates uh, to the logo of Mont Blanc. A facade that during the night can receive different projections, like the ones that we are seeing, and these are the drawings that we developed for the facade, and we had a mock-up one-to-one done uh, from the very beginning in the site, uh, in the job. And I have to tell you that we learned something very special. It's very difficult to build black concrete, nearly impossible. And well, anyway, we work with it. And that is the final building built. It's going to be opened the 13th of May. And the facade is not finished in this image yet, but it's the last images that I had. As you see, the different, uh, the different elements of the concrete in the inside. Uh, the exhibition areas, this was the render that we presented to the competition. This is the building now, the uh, different exhibitions that are going to be started, and the facade from the outside. And now we are in the process of trying the different lighting of the facade, which is not yet finished, as you can see, but we are in the process of trying. It's going to be finished, hopefully, for the 13th of May. But if we won this competition, I think it's because of the uh, idea that generated it. We were looking simply uh, to the box that hold the pens. So we presented a model that was really a box with the same proportion as uh, the pens. And when you open it, you find inside the complexity that you need for developing the building that we wanted. <laughs> and uh, I, sorry if I was too long, but I wanted to show you this building. This is a foundation, the Arvo Park Foundation in Estonia. So we entered a competition for the Arvo Park Foundation in this beautiful place. It's uh, uh, the peninsula of Laulasma, near at 40 kilometers of the city of Tallinn. In this beautiful landscape, Arvo Park and his family, his wife Nora, live. And it is here where the Part family and the government of Estonia decided to build the foundation for Arvo Part in, commemora in commemoration of the 100 years of the uh, freedom of Estonia. For us, a project about landscape, music, and architecture. This is Arvo Part. Arvo Part, younger, when he was making his compositions with bells, and this is one of the uh, musical notations of Arvo Part. Arvo Part, I don't know if you know him, but he is the 
living composer most reproduced of the world. And understanding his importance, uh, the government of Estonia decided to build his foundation. A competition that for us was special in every way, especially also from the beginning, in the way that they give us the breath. In this, uh, in this um, helicoat that we immediately related to one of his compositions, Tabula, and in fact, it was the name of our competition. So we started working with this uh, helicoat, and we also decided to work with pentagons, because pentagon is the figure that is more repeated in nature. For us, we are going to build patios, because the patios were represented the silence in music. The building had to belong to the landscape, so we uh, decided uh, to put the entrance very near the road where you left the car and then you had to go walking through the, uh, through the woods until you found the building in a place where there were less trees than in the rest of the places in order for us to be able to eliminate the least amount of trees of that beautiful forest. The elements of the building, the patios that organize the public spaces, a varying wall that separates the public from the private spaces and that also holds the third important element. A floating roof, a roof that appeared to be floating in the middle of the woods. The roof, through its uh, different inclinations, organized the more pu public and the more private space. And the facade was organized around a series of small columns that related both to music and to landscape. And from this idea of relating to music, we were working suddenly with Arbo Part, and someday we started tracing our simple working drawings, because it's this lighting drawing, on top of his notations. And from that appeared a series of relations, even sometimes in the way of drawing. And in fact, the Arbo Part Foundation has done a book about the relations of the drawings of the architecture and the music. And this is the day that we traced uh, uh, the building in the woods. And this is Arvo Part with us. Arvo Part is a person that is so tender and nice and always smiling. And that day, he was a little bit quiet. And I think, I don't know if exactly there, he was telling us Listen, I'm not sure that I like the place. I think that we have to move the building because I think that in the place that it is now, we are going to be able to see a house that is around there, only one single house. So we had to go back to work with him and try to move the building, which is quite a, different, a difficult thing to do. And while he saw us working, he came to us and he said, listen, now I understand that for a composer and for an architect, working is the same thing. We never finish. We can always continue developing and getting better our project. Uh, this is the people of the Upper Part Foundation in the goods, in the place uh, that the building is going to be set. And um, in, in this building, everything was important and always everything was related to music. This is the day uh, that the foundation was, I mean, the um, foundation of the building was finished. And there was, you see, the choir behind. Because uh, what I have to say about this project is that it became a very special project for everybody. These are images of the construction. Um, everything was special there. 
and the people of the foundation managed to give everybody the feeling that they were working for something special. And the construction people, the engineers, uh, we, everybody, we were working in a real team and we were pushing all to do the best of us. And I think that is the way, uh, the only possible way to be able to build uh, this kind of architecture. It was also very impressive to build under the snow. The building was finished, finished on time. A building that you have to access through a path of the woods that we opened and then closed again, only a trace. When you get to the entrance, you get to the facade with the small columns, columns that are different. Some are structural, some are mechanical, and some are, some are simply to get the rhythm. We only used two different materials, apart from the column, the glass, and the wood. The wood for the opaque facades and the whole window large window of glass in order to connect with the landscape. An interior fluid space connecting the patios and the woods outside. The landscape of the exterior also introduced in the patios. If we follow the structural wall, the wall, uh, it's a wall that organizes the building and a lot of the important areas are introduced in that wall. For example, the library. The entrance to the library is produced in one of the intersections of the two courtyards. Going back to the wall and running it in the different direction, we get to a very important part, a small auditorium built as a wooden box. The colors of the furniture are related to the different colors of the wood in the different times of the year. The acoustical panels were uh, also made of wood and then especially for Arbo Part, for an Spanish acoustical guy, um, Eugenia Rao, and Arvopart was very happy about the sound of the music in the day of the opening. This is the window that Arvopart wanted us to move in order not to see the house, and he was right, because you cannot see anything there. The roof and the patios through which you can see another special element, a chapel. because Arbo Part and Nora are very religious and they wanted to have a small chapel. They wanted to have it inside uh, the foundation, so we decided to put it in one of the patios. A little small chapel, concrete in the outside, white in the inside, so they could put whatever element they wanted in the inside there. The different patios that are really uh, a way of expressing all uh, the concept of the building. The geometry, the materials, and the idea of looking out. Also important in Estonia, the way that you can see uh, the building during the night, because there are many months of the year where the light is very short. And another important element, a tower, because Arbopart wanted to see the sea. A sea that was very near us, but there was no way to see it other than going above the trees in order to be able to look. So we decided to build a tower, with something that was already asked in the brief. So we went back to the notations of Arbopart 
and we built a tower with the base of a pentagon with the structure of the same uh, of the same columns that organize the facade of the building tied together by, by an helicoid of metal an empty tower except for a stair and an elevator that will get us above the trees And we hope that Arvo Part there can compose more of this beautiful music that you are listening. This is the image that we presented to the competition, and this is the final image in a project that for us has been about landscape, music, and architecture. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.